So around 10 months ago, I started working on remaking Undertale in 3D, and I severely underestimated the overwhelming amount of work that needed to go into it. This project by far has the most 3D models I've had to create for any video on my channel, and each of these models also has way more detail. Just for a quick comparison, this is an example of a highly detailed model for my Zelda remake, and now this is a highly detailed model for Undertale. Even the less detailed models have much more complexity. Needless to say, I needed to fill myself with determination to get myself to finish this game, and by that I mean Gamersups, who I recently just partnered with. If you haven't heard of it, Gamersups is a company that sells energy drinks, with flavors ranging from the more typical flavors like grape and red raspberry, to the more interesting flavors like... Anime Girl Thigh. My go-to flavors have been the Jujutsu Kaisen Curse Energy and the Strawberry Lemonade. If energy drinks aren't your thing, they've been adding new products like tea, food bars, and their latest product, Gamer Soup's Instant Noodles. And a lot of their products are anime themed, but they do have a button for people who aren't into that and don't want to walk around with some anime girl on their cup. So if you want to try it out, you can use my code can't drink this to get 10% off any order. If you guys end up really liking it, we might even get a cup design or flavor of our own at some point. And now back to the video. Now I know I said I just started this project around 10 months ago, but that's not entirely true. I actually started working on it all the way back at the beginning of 2022, but I only ended up working on it for a few days before giving up. And the reason for that is because modeling Frisk is hard. If you look at the sprite for Frisk, you can see that it isn't symmetrical. The left ear is exposed while the right ear is hidden beneath hair. The head is off center and the left leg is bigger than the right leg. When trying to account for all of these, it made the modeling process pretty difficult. Normally what I would do is take the sprite for both of the front view and the side view, stretch them out, and then cut off any extra voxels. But the problem was trying to figure out how to model the head from there, especially for the part around the left ear. It took me several attempts trying different approaches until I finally landed on something that looked pretty good. And from there I was able to make a walk style pretty easily by just changing the arms and legs. After importing Frisk into Unity, I then set it up so that they were able to walk around. With Frisk able to walk around now, I needed to get started on creating the level for Frisk to explore. I found a map for the ruins, and it seems... way longer than I remember. For this project, I tried out this 3D tile map feature that I found to try and make the level building process easier. I made textures for all the different walls and floors, and then made some materials. Then I used ProBuilder to make some models for the floor tiles and the walls. I made sure to make them into flat planes so that the backside wouldn't be visible. Then for the corner walls, I made sure to have a slightly angled wall connecting the two sides instead of just coming to a right angle. Originally, I had these small outer rim parts on the top of the walls, but I ended up just deleting them because they would look weird when looking through the wall, and it obstructed the view. And with these floor tiles and wall tiles all set up, I could now go around placing them with the tile map brush tool. A lot of this was just tedious work placing them where they needed to go, and for some parts I needed to make new wall tiles because the walls there were a bit taller in some areas. The next thing I wanted to do was change the skybox to be completely black so it was like standing in the void. For this I changed the skybox from default skybox to default diffuse. Unity gave me a warning saying that this shader doesn't support skybox rendering, but I'm going to pretend I didn't see that because it looks like it's working to me. With this new black background, I added a new sprite for the gradient that fades to black to make the top and bottom of the ruins entrance look a bit more natural. And the last thing to do before moving on to create more voxel models is to do the walls inside of Toriel's house. The floor here doesn't follow the same pattern as the rest of the ruins. The ruins floor has room for an exact number of floor tiles, unlike in Toriel's house. So what I did was make some walls using ProBuilder, and then I'd go back and do the floors later using Magic Voxel. But before creating the models for props on the map, I wanted to create some more NPC characters. The ruins has four NPC characters, Flowey, Toriel, Froggit, and Napstablook. I started with Flowey since it's the first character you meet in the game. The basic flowey model was pretty easy. It's just a normal flower with a face on it, with a second model where the mouth is open so we can talk. The hard part comes from the animations. Flowey has two animations, one where he's laughing, and another where he sinks into the ground. The one where he sinks into the ground was fairly easy. All I had to do was straighten out the stem, change the petals a bit to make it look like he's moving, and then lower him into the ground. The laughing model was the challenging part. I had to make a few models, gradually growing the sides of his face, and distorting it along the way. Then the laughing part just loops between two frames, where one has the mouth open more than the other. When putting the animations together, I think it came together pretty well. Next up I had Toriel. I used the same modeling trick to make her that I used for Frisk, and I similarly had some bad attempts with her. The first one made her look a bit bloated in the face. So I tried again, and this time cut out some holes in between her face and the ears, and slimmed down her face, and I think it looks a bit better. Toriel has a few animations of her own, most of them involving Frisk. After making a basic walk cycle, I edited it so that she could hold onto Frisk's hand for the part where she guides Frisk through the spike maze. There's also the animation where she pats Frisk on the head when showing them to their room. There's one frame where she's holding the phone to call Frisk near the entrance to her house. Toriel also sits on Cheriel while reading a book, and then stands up while closing the book. And the final animation for Toriel is when she's hugging Frisk at the end of the ruins. This one was a bit weird since I had to stretch Toriel's arms to be longer than they normally would be to fully wrap her arms around Frisk. The only other option I would have would be placing Frisk slightly inside of Toriel, which would probably also look weird. For the third NPC, we have the Froggit. 
Frog can be seen in a few places on the overworld ruins map outside of battle, and each of these follows the same idle animation pattern. The head will bob up and down, while the eyes on its stomach will move left and right. You can never see Froggit from the side, so I had to guess at what it would look like. I think it kinda turned out more like a dog rather than a frog though. And now for the last NPC, we have Napstablook. Napstablook's design is pretty straightforward. He basically looks like a person wearing a white sheet pretending to be a ghost, so there's not a whole lot of detail there. But regardless, after finishing the models for all the characters, it was time to start the modeling process for everything else in the ruins, which is where I think most of my time was spent. Each room had various props and other stuff that needed to be turned into voxel models. Some of them were pretty basic like these leaves or these signs, but others got fairly complicated like this pillar. The pillar alone took several hours of work. First I had to see what it looked like from the front, and then from the side, and then combine those together before finally adding some detail and smoothing it out for the finished product. These doorways also had a similar amount of detail put into them. Luckily, a lot of things were less complicated like the buttons, the spikes, these levers, the vines, the leaves, and these signposts. But other things like the spiderwebs, the rocks, the candy bowl, the dummy, and the save point took a bit more work. For some things like the save point, the ribbon, and the knife, I made sure to make it so that they are always facing towards the camera. My models for these looked a bit weird when viewed from other angles, especially the save point, so facing it towards the camera allowed them to stay 3D while also looking normal. Before moving inside of Toriel's house, there were just a few more props to place in the ruins, all of which were extremely detailed. The first being the staircase in the beginning. It took me a while to decide which height worked best for the stairs, and then also having to fill in all the gaps where the black color is. If I lighten it, you can see all the detail that went there. The next thing was the tree in front of Toriel's house. This one probably took half a day, if not longer, to finish. I had to go through a few different approaches to get it to look as best as I could while staying true to the original, and I think what I came up with looks pretty good. And finally there was this entire area overlooking the city of home. I made these three buildings in the very front row into 3D models, and then everything behind it was layers of flat planes set some distance apart. It's set up similar to how you would create a parallax effect. And now we can finally start with the models inside of Toriel's house. The first thing I did was create all the floors in Magical Voxel, and then import them into the scene. I had to break some of them up into different parts because it only allows for models that fit within a 256 block cube. Then I made the models in the red bedroom, the blue bedroom, the hallway, the living room, the kitchen, and the foyer. And the last step was to create the staircase that leads down to the basement. And with that, all the models are now finished, and we can move on to some gameplay. The first thing I wanted to do was make it so that only a few rooms would be loaded in at a time, and would spawn and despawn as you move throughout the ruins. This was mainly due to performance issues. If I had just left everything on all the time, I would experience quite a bit of lag when standing at one end of the map. I did something slightly different for the beginning and ending rooms though. I moved them further back and placed them inside of a black boxed room. Then I brought back the portals that I used in the portal game I made, thanks again to Sebastian Lake for these, and I made it so that these doorways would seamlessly teleport the player to different parts of the map. It also ends up giving it this cool effect where it looks like the room doesn't exist behind the doorway, and then all of a sudden it's just there. Now that the player can properly traverse the map, I needed to start adding in a way for the player to interact with things. So I made a script called Interact, which is responsible for most of the things the player can interact with. It can store some dialogue along with the option to add in a face sprite to the dialogue box. It also keeps track of what face the sprite should be making as the character talks. After interacting with the object, all of this information is then added to the dialogue system in a queue. So after it adds the dialogue, it removes them from the queue after they are read. Once all of the dialogue is read, it then closes the dialogue box. If this dialogue is supposed to trigger an encounter at the end, it will then play an animation to shift over to the battle scene. There's also the special animation that plays when transitioning to the battle with Toriel, where the level fades away first. This interact script is also responsible for transitioning to random encounters. The random encounter adds nothing to the dialogue system, and since the dialogue is immediately finished, it instead just transitions to battle. Each room has a set of battles which are possible to enter. So for example, some rooms can encounter Froggit, while others can't. This information is tracked by the monster spawner script. When entering a room, it resets your step counter, and then calculates the number of steps needed before having a random encounter. This number gradually increases with the more kills you have, so farming kills for a genocide run usually takes a while. Once you have enough kills, you will now start to enter a battle where nobody came. After this, the frog NPCs won't appear anymore, and Napsablook will fade away before you start talking to him. And now with all this talk about battles, I think it's time to start talking about the last part of the game, which is the enemy encounters. Once you're in a battle, you can pick which action you want to do. You can fight the enemies by timing your attacks to do more damage, or you can pick from one of several acts to do. These acts are peaceful options that you can take in battle, and if you do the right act or meet the right conditions, you can then spare the enemy. After your turn is the enemy turn. The dialogue box will start to shrink and fade away before shifting to a new angled perspective. Originally I was planning on making the battle play out like Velocibox, where the attacks would come at you as you move around the box. But the only reason I thought of that was because I was remembering one specific attack from the battle with Sands, and then I realized that like 99% of the attacks are nothing like that. So instead I made it shift to this 3D perspective. 
The player's soul can move in any direction to dodge the attacks until the attack ends. Getting hit will reduce your HP and cause the screen to shake. Playing in this perspective makes it hard to tell where everything is though, so I place some shadows on the floor to help identify where the player is and where the attacks are. For the player shadow, I also made it so that the shadow will be more opaque when you are closer to the floor and more transparent when you're closer to the ceiling. The 3D perspective trivializes some attacks, as it makes them much easier to dodge. However, it also makes some attacks much harder to dodge, so it really depends on which enemy you're facing. I'll try to talk about the attacks without spoiling how to avoid them, so you can figure that out by yourself while you're playing. The first attack is Froggit, and has three attacks. The first attack is the Fly attack. Froggit will spawn five flies that will fly towards the last position of the player. Every second or so, it will change direction and update the last position of the player. The next attack is similar, but it instead uses a couple of balls that shoot from the ceiling and despawn when hitting the floor. This one never changes directions. And the last attack is the Frog Jump, which only activates when Froggit is alone in battle. Froggit will spawn a couple of frogs that will jump from right to left at a random height and random speed. The next enemy is Whimson, which has two attacks. The first attack spawns butterflies from the floor around the player, and they'll fly straight up towards the ceiling before despawning. The other attack is the butterfly circle. This attack is pretty straightforward. The butterflies fly in a circle around the player, and the circle will grow larger and smaller over time. The next up is Moldmall, which also has two attacks. The first attack spawns large balls that fall from the ceiling in a zigzag pattern. The other attack is similar, except the balls fall in a straight line, and explode after some time into smaller pellets. After Moldsmall is Migos, who has two special attacks. Migos always appears with other enemies, so when there's other enemies still active in battle, it always activates its first attack. This attack spawns butterflies from the sides of the bullet board, and they randomly choose to either fly up or down. If Migos is alone in battle, it'll start to be happy, and it has an attack where it just dances. The Vegetoid's two attacks also have a special condition on them. Both attacks will spawn one green version of the attack. This one will heal the player instead of damaging the player. The Carrot attack rains down carrots from the sky, and the Vegetable attack will spawn in a bunch of vegetables that bounce around in random directions. Luke's is the final enemy before the bosses that has two versions of two different attacks. The first attack spawns in a couple of balls that will bounce around, slowly growing in speed, and the second attack spawns in a bunch of worm-like creatures that wiggle around the bullet board. Both attacks have a slow and fast version. Which version plays depends on the actions you take during the battle. And now, onto the bosses. I'll start with Flowey since he really isn't a boss. His encounter is unique since there's no grid, and there's no options for you to do in battle. As he talks, he'll start to spawn some friendliness pellets at you. He also has another attack where he spawns a giant ring of pellets that slowly close in on you. Next is Napsplook, who's like a mini boss. He has two attacks, and like Luke's, they'll play at varying speeds depending on the actions taken in battle. For the first attack, he cries out these large tears that fall down into the bullet board. If the player does some specific actions, he'll instead start to cry upwards, showing you his dapper blook look. For the other attack, he has these long lightning bolt tiers that fall down and work their way around the bullet board, tracking the player's position before finding to fall onto the player. And now for the first real boss of the game, we have Toriel. Toriel has four attacks, with slightly different versions as well. The first attack spawns in flames from the ceiling that sweep back and forth. There's a slightly different version of this attack as well, with a shorter bullet board that also spawns flames on the left and right, similar to the Miyagos butterfly attack. The next attack spawns flames in a helix shape, and the shape of the helix slightly changes over time as well. This attack was simple for me to add since I just had to change one line of code from the sweeping attack to make it work like this instead. The third attack is one where Toriel moves her hand across the bullet board, spawning in flames that act as homing missiles. This attack has a second variation as well, where there's two hands instead of one. And the final attack has flames that fall straight down from the sky and try to avoid the player if they get too close. This attack only activates when Frisk is low on HP, as Toriel tries to take mercy on them. And that's pretty much it for the attacks. The only other thing worth mentioning here was that I also added the ability to use items in battle. And with that, the game is basically finished. All that was left at this point was to add in the pause menu, a new settings menu, which as you can see I also added in a first person's perspective, and I added in as many easter eggs as I could find from the original. There are points in the game where Flowey can be seen stalking the player, the annoying dog steals the cell phone from Toriel and keeps calling the player, there's a hidden froggit in the wall, and this froggit here only appears if you meet certain conditions. So I'll stop talking here and let you try it all out for yourself. I'll put a link in the description for the download. It'll have a video showing how to download and run the game if you can't figure it out, as well as showing the controls. Alright, see ya.